Well, aloha and good morning. It is June 10th here in Hawaii. We want to thank all of you for tuning in to the platform of the Honolulu Star Advertiser for the COVID-19 care conversation brought to you by the Hawaii Executive Collaborative and Hawaii Pacific Health. Uh, great to see some people already tuning in. Uh, aloha to Tom and Curtis who are watching us. Uh, I'm Ryan Kalesuji along with Yanji Denise, and uh, we are here once again to sort of give you information and keep you up to date with all the things happening related to COVID-19 here in the state, as well as update you on some of the headlines and news that are happening here in Hawaii. And Yanji, we have a doctor in the house today. That's right. We have Dr. Sana Christopher, who is uh, specializes in cardiology. And what's so interesting about the work that she does is that she's looking at the integration of, you know, what happens to COVID patients and, and when it comes to cardiac health. There's so much that is unknown about this disease. And so we've invited her to come on and talk to us about some of the complications that cardiologists are seeing in COVID-19 patients, some things that we need to know when it comes to this, and also emphasizing again how important it is to stay connected to your provider because we know yesterday's paper had a great article about how many people have been reluctant to go to their doctor and just how so many physicians are seeing big declines in their practice right now. That's right. So if you have a question for the doctor, please, we encourage you to enter it into our comments as, uh, and let us know where you're watching from. We always love hearing where people are tuning in from. And if you have an opportunity, please share this video so that we can reach more people and get more people educated and aware of the things that are happening, especially with important conversations like this one about health. Now, like we always do, we like to give an update with some of the recent totals of COVID-19 cases here in the state of Hawaii. And yesterday, as of noon, there were six new cases reporting, reported, bringing the total to 682 positive cases of COVID-19 here in Hawaii since the pandemic began. Uh, again, there has been no new deaths. The last death reported on May 13th, so that death toll remains at 17, and more than 95% of those infected have recovered Six, however, a little higher than what, of course, we've been seeing last week and in the previous weeks. Uh, we've heard from state officials that th that number is expected to be a little higher than what we were seeing in those ones and twos and zeros in that uh, as Hawaii reopens, more people are obviously going to be uh, exposed to different people and places, which could lead to some of the spread of the diseases. But they uh, continue to encourage people to use social distancing and all the practices that they have sort of encouraged since this pandemic began to continue to regulate and keep those numbers low. Yeah, I mean, we're really seeing an ebb and flow in terms of how many people are getting together. Now that restaurants have reopened, we see a lot of retail reopening. We know that uh, gyms and other facilities are getting ready to reopen a little bit later this month. And the big, uh, the big one too, of course, being neighbor island travel opening next week. So all of those factors coming together. And then there is the question of whether or not some of the protests that we saw over the weekend, some of those rallies, um, you know, the governor did say on this program on Monday that he advised anyone who had gone to one of those events to please shelter in place and, uh, you know, socially distance, self-quarantine, if you will, um, just to make sure that you're not infecting anyone. So, you know, we'll, we'll have to see as we start to loosen things up and, you know, maybe not everyone always wearing a mask and not always observing that social distancing. It's, it's hard to believe, you know, March 25th is when Ryan, you and I started this daily broadcast and we've been in this for a while. And I think a lot of people start to experience a little bit of um, social distancing and mask and what have you fatigue, but it is so important to keep up those efforts. One of those efforts too, is making sure that people abide by the quarantine when they come back into our state. You know, we've seen a big focus on travelers, on visitors, visitors coming in and those numbers do continue to increase and there have been some arrests. But yesterday we saw uh, reported the first resident who violated uh, that order now being arrested in Waikiki. That's right. That again, as you said, that is the first time, of course, we've heard of those visitors who have been in violation of that 14 day quarantine who were reported by hotel guests. Uh, this resident actually lived in Waikiki, went out for a swim after they arrived and was arrested. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're seeing that again, that the you really the state is trying to do their best in keeping accountability to those people who are arriving here to the islands and making sure they really hold true to that 14-day quarantine regardless of if they are a visitor or if they are a Hawaii resident. We want to welcome in our doctor, Dr. Sana Christopher, an interventional cardiologist at Polymomi Medical Center. She's joining us this morning. Doctor, so good to see you. Thank you for being here. Um, let's dive right into what we're seeing when it comes to coronavirus patients 
and heart issues, why are they more likely to be at risk when it comes to COVID-19? Thank you very much for having me. So um, you bring up a very important point about cardiac care uh, in patients with coronavirus. So the data that we saw emerge when the surge happened initially with coronavirus was that there was a very particular subset of patients, specifically patients who had pre-existing heart disease, who uh, had high blood pressure and diabetes that were noted to do poorly if they did get coronavirus. Also, we noticed that people who had contracted coronavirus were having a lot of cardiac complications as well. They were having heart attacks or a lot of inflammation of their heart muscle or the sac around the heart. So definitely a very significant cardiac involvement uh, with patients who had coronavirus or who were at risk for it. Now, these patients also uh, did poorly overall. Uh, so pre-existing conditions, specifically pre-existing heart conditions, we did see a very strong correlation with doing poorly and being at risk for coronavirus. You know, when this first happened, there was a, obviously a lot of uh, attention being placed on the lung capacity, right? We, we've heard reports of people just having difficulty to breathe. Of course, the ventilators that were sent in and, and were becoming a shortage and in high demand as well to prepare. Uh, how much of that uh, does impact the heart, though? Because uh, I think that there was a lot of attention placed on the lungs, but you know that there are reports now that the heart is also uh, very significant, can significantly be impacted by those who uh, test positive for COVID-19. Absolutely. Um, and this is something I emphasize to even my patients who do not have uh, uh, coronavirus is that the heart and lungs work very, very closely. So if one is impacted in a negative way or, or infected, it, it automatically puts a lot of strain on the other organ. Now, with coronavirus, not only was there a lot of lung involvement, as you pointed out, but there was also uh, involvement with the heart that was completely independent of whatever was going on in the lungs. So it was almost a double hit to the heart where you were working with lungs that were struggling already. Uh, and then there was the additional, uh, additional involvement to the heart, as I mentioned, with increased heart attacks and increased inflammation to the heart that we noticed. So um, while the initial focus was on the lungs, I think it started becoming apparent very early on that there was a very strong cardiac or heart component to it. And I think a lot of hospitals then moved on and changed their strategy and started doing a lot of cardiac management in addition to what they were doing for the lungs. You know, we've talked a lot, uh, at the public health officials have s talked a lot about people who are considered high risk. Um, if you are somebody who has a pre-existing condition, you need to be extra careful when it comes to this disease. But a lot of people might not consider themselves high risk if they're, you know, they feel relatively healthy. But um, what would you say to patients who do have, you know, heart, who have had some heart complications, maybe not a full heart attack, uh, but, you know, to, to, to emphasize um, or to keep in mind that they are at, in a higher risk category, because you tend to think of someone who has a severe audio, autoimmune disease, but it sounds like this could, this could be actually a, a bigger umbrella. Absolutely. I and think Dr. I'm, so, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, if you can just hold the mic out a little bit when you talk about sure, sure. that. Absolutely. Think is, a little, is this yeah. better? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. So um, I think that you you do bring up um, an even um, a, a bigger issue, and that is undiagnosed disease. Um, a lot of people tend to have undiagnosed high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and high diabetes. These are not conditions that will make you feel sick right away, but what they can do is over the course of time, they work, uh, they work on, on weakening your organs. And the, the people then may not feel symptomatic with it, but they are already in that high risk category. Now, the way to get around that is by really going in and getting yourself evaluated by a primary care doctor or any other provider to get to see if you are somebody who has undiagnosed conditions such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high diabetes, because these are actually also risk factors for heart disease. Um, now, once those are managed appropriately, then you also may need evaluation for heart disease as well. And some people tend to have heart disease and not exactly have the typical symptoms or have any symptoms at all. And I would say those people are still people who are at risk for, uh, for coronavirus and, and doing poorly if they do get infected. So the way around that really is by establishing care with a primary care uh, doctor 
continuing follow-up appointments and making sure that you work on those risk factors to, to, to basically minimize your risk overall. You know, I want to expand a little bit more on, you know, just seeing a doctor overall, because there was an article in the paper yesterday in the Honolulu Star Advertiser uh, that, you know, reported on a survey of just over a thousand Hawaii physicians with, who said that more than 70% reported a drop of 50% or more in just overall patient care. Uh, why do you think, what is it attributing to some of these factors where people just uh, are too afraid to come in? Or do you think that maybe uh, people are just healthier because they're not being exposed? I mean, what are some of the reasons why we're seeing that dramatic decrease in just overall visits and care? I do uh, based on the trends that we've noted um, universally, you know, both in Hawaii and on the mainland, fearful. People are fearful of being exposed. And unfortunately, these are our patients who need the most care. Um, overall, um, just in talking to my own patients, uh, I have noticed that there are concerns about patients coming into the office or coming into the hospital because they're worried that they may risk exposure and actually contract uh, a coronavirus in, in the medical setting. That is definitely an issue, but an even bigger issue that we've noticed is people not seeking care for conditions that need to be treated immediately, such as heart attacks and strokes. Um, those are conditions where early detection and treatment is really what determines how, how well you do with it long term. Um, however, we are noticing that same sort of fear because people are, are, are worried about being exposed if they present to the emergency room or to the hospital that are delaying their care and ending up with worse outcomes. Uh, so I think that there is uh, there are multiple factors that go into why there's been a decrease overall in people coming in, one, of course, being the fear and the other being um, people staying at home. You know, our social distancing measures overall, I think we're very, very helpful in limiting the number of cases that we did see in Hawaii. Um, and I think that overall that contributed to uh, the numbers remaining lower than what we had anticipated with the actual surge that we were fearing early on when, when numbers were starting to spike. So there's that, but overall, the care, sh there, there, there's no risk of exposure in terms of establishing care and continuing your follow-up and also seeking help when you really need it, such as serious things, such as heart attacks and strokes. You know, the state is reporting a pretty significant a drop in vaccinations. They're encouraging patients to also make sure that their children are up to speed. School is perhaps going to be coming into session soon. You know, we don't have a full plan from the DOE, but children are going to start seeing each other. Um, t tell us a little bit about, you know, parents and children, because I know I'm a mom of two, um, and you do have a little bit of trepidation about taking your kids in, even for those routine visits, because, well, they don't seem sick now, why should I risk that exposure? Right, and, and that's an even bigger thing is that routine health follow-up and routine vaccinations should not fall to the to, uh, to the wayside now. I think this, if anything, is, is, is a big wake-up call that establishing uh, routine care is something that will keep you healthy. And, uh, you know, it goes into, once again, that uh, what I had mentioned earlier about chronic conditions. Vaccinations are tremendous in, in establishing what is called herd immunity. Uh, for, for everybody to have the level of uh, protection from any sort of uh, conditions that the vaccination covers. This is especially important for children as we are going back into the, the uh, schools reopening in September, and even more important for our elderly patients because they are folks who are going to be at risk for once again, things like the flu and pneumonia that they need their routine vaccinations for. So that is something that I, I would say that uh, even myself and I, as, as a representative of the overwhelming health community, is that vaccinations are very, very important to stay on top of, particularly in this time. Um, and essentially coming and getting medical care for your vaccinations is highly recommended. Uh, I want to bring in a, a question from a viewer. James is asking, how long can you be symptomatic and can you tell if you are? And if you don't have, I think, symptoms, you meant to say, can you get tested? So um, essentially what we had noticed was that when 
people, the asymptomatic carriers were folks who then basically uh, were had tested positive for COVID, but were completely asymptomatic. We then started looking at the, the cycle of how the virus worked, and it was noted that there could be at least up to, uh, up to 14 days where people displayed no symptoms um, based on when their exposure was to when they became symptomatic. So that is what was really the concerning part, is that most of the people who didn't realize that they had coronavirus were actually completely asymptomatic and then uh, exposed other people to coronavirus. Um, so I would say about 14 days is what we had noticed that there could, that you could have been exposed, remained asymptomatic, but are still at risk. Um, and then in terms of seeking, um, seeking testing, if you are asymptomatic, once again, I, I think it's, it, it boils down to what your exposure is. Be very particular about social distancing measures, wearing a mask. We are still limiting travel. I know that there are talks about uh, expanding travel options. Um, but even then, the social distancing should, should be very, very strictly practiced. Um, and I think if that's the case, if you have suspicion you have been exposed, it is reasonable to talk to a provider to see if you need to be tested. You know, on that subject of travel, we're seeing just such different outcomes across the country. A number of states, Arizona is a good example, 21 states now have seen big surges in new COVID cases, 14 states actually reporting the highest COVID-19 cases since the pandemic began. Um, you know, even though there is that kind of coronavirus fatigue and people are, you know, getting tired of social distancing and wearing those masks, as you mentioned, I wonder how much you and your colleagues are tracking what's happening in hospitals on the mainland and how that affects how you are preparing um, as we start to ponder opening up to tourism. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, uh, we are certainly watching the trends on the mainland very closely. Um, specifically because Hawaii itself tends to be a very unique environment in terms of travel. Um, essentially, what we are noticing, as you mentioned, the surges as, as social distancing measures and travel has been liberalized is, is that there has been a spike. There has been a tremendous spike. Um, we, I, I would highly recommend that as of now, traveling um, unless it's unless it's completely necessary, should probably be uh, avoided, especially for our higher risk patients that I had mentioned. So our patients with heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes. Um, even though you can practice very very strict measure, the risk of exposure is very high during traveling. So that I think is 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 partly to explain as to why there has been such a surge. Social distancing becomes even harder to maintain if you are in an environment such as an airplane or a train where you can't really, where you can only distance yourself so far from someone adjacent to you and you're there for a, a, a whatever period of time that you're traveling. Um, so I, I, I think that as far as traveling is concerned, social distancing, that is the, the emphasis on that becomes even, even stronger. You know, as we sort of navigate through this time, and and I'm not saying we're in a lull, but but we certainly are at a point in time where case count is low and and things are looking good. Uh, is a hospital and, and and you know maybe where you work at uh, what are what is being done now to sort of gear up for a potential second wave? Because we we've, we've heard the reports of PPE shortages and you, you know all these other things that uh, sort of when you're in the midst of all this craziness and you're dealing with it, you're not able to sort of restock. So I guess. Are, are efforts being made to sort of prepare for this uh, so that if we do get an influx of cases that the hospitals are prepared and we're not seeing maybe the shortage that we would have seen earlier on when we weren't prepared for it? Absolutely. That is a huge focus in our strategy here at Hawaii Pacific Health is to actually the, the preparedness for what could be a potential surge. Um, I think that this also came we, uh, from the lessons that we learned preparing for the surge when it was happening on the mainland. So we've taken all the trends that we saw on the mainland and try to prepare ourselves for it. Uh, things that we're implementing here at Hawaii Pacific Health, we're doing temperature checks at all the access points here. Um, we're also practicing very strict social distancing measures and also limiting people in waiting areas, whether it's in the office, in the emergency room, at all hospital access points. Uh, so I think that in itself in, uh, limits the sort of exposure potential. 
Now, as a hospital, it becomes important to make sure that we are prepared from a capacity standpoint. And once again, we learned a lot preparing initially when the surge was happening on the mainland as to how we can tackle this best. And there's definitely a very strong plan in place uh, if there is another potential surge that it is to occur with the second wave. Okay, well, doctor, we know you're busy, but we want to ask you just finally, if you have some final thoughts and advice for our viewers. Um, there's a lot of people, as we've talked about here, who kind of are sick of wearing those masks and social distancing. What's your me message to all of us today? I think the biggest message that I would like to, to, to pass forth is, is really we are not out of the woods yet. Uh, even though that there's been liberalization of, um, of, of, of the shelter in place and travel plans, this is actually the moment where we need to practice uh, our, our measures of wearing masks in all public places, limiting numbers in, uh, in, in locations, and also practicing the social distancing, because this is what's going to determine ultimately as what the second wave will look like. Um, so definitely continue to practice those. If you develop any amount of symptoms, please seek medical care, and more importantly, do not fear seeking care for conditions uh, that need attention, such as for heart attacks or strokes, and continue on uh, establishing care with your primary care providers and to make sure that that's not falling off to the wayside. All right, Dr. Christopher, thank you so much uh, for taking time and for giving us an update on, on some of the things that you're seeing there on the front lines. Absolutely. And of course, thank you for uh, all that you're doing to help keep our community healthy. Take thank care. Thank you very much. Aloha. Thank Bye. You. Well, interesting to hear her talking about really watching the other states and what they're doing. And, you know, I know that, you know, on a personal level, I also want to get out there. I want to go eat out and yeah. see all my friends and do all the things. And uh, it can be really tough. But she said it right there at the end that this is the moment that determines what the next wave, if there is one, will look like. And so it's so important to, again, be reminded of why we're actually doing this. And it's because of those complications that she's talking about to see all those cardiac consequences uh, because of COVID-19. It definitely gives you pause when, you know, as we move forward. And really, you know, just to overall uh, protect the patients and, and ensuring that it is safe, you know, I have to admit, last week I wasn't feeling good. <clears throat> I was actually running a fever, and I got tested for COVID. Uh, it came back negative, but uh, just to go through the process uh, was was pretty interesting because they really do uh, make sure that you are not exposed to anything else. Uh, you know, I stayed in my car basically, and they had a nurse talk to me over the phone, and so. Uh, you know, they, they are making all those efforts to ensure that people are safe and that those who need care in the hospitals and, and other the, in these other medical uh, facilities, uh, that they are protected. And, and so uh, really the, the fear of going in because of the possible exposure really shouldn't be the reason why you hold off on I'm going to see a care physician. So great to sort of hear that message uh, reiterated again. Yeah, and on that subject of testing, we, we're seeing uh, testing now more widespread when it comes to care home workers. There's an article in the paper that talks about 550 healthcare workers that were tested as part of the Arcadia family group of companies. Uh, those, of course, are folks who run the long-term care facilities, and you see one getting tested right there. This is to because the people that these folks are caring for, of course, are the most at risk. Uh, we have seen a few uh, home care or long-term care facilities uh, have COVID cases. And so the screening is meant to be a preventative way to make sure that, you know, anyone who might be a carrier who is taking care of some of these kapuna is uh, found quickly because as she said, you know, you could have 14 days of no symptoms and still have the virus. Yeah, an interesting article about that and encourage people to head on over to the uh, Honolulu Star Advertiser to read more up on that. Uh, also, it, uh, you know, always reported is just the number of visitors that continue to travel to Hawaii uh, despite the 14-day mandatory self-quarantine period and you know passengers did not are not stopping coming uh, another 529 visitors reported coming into the state on Monday and uh, you know those visitor count was actually the third highest since the quarantine order began and so uh, we continue to see those numbers uh, increase as more and more people see those lifts and we continue to see those numbers list as it gets into the summertime and people are more uh, comfortable about traveling potentially with other, these other states opening. Uh, again, the governor, as we spoke to him on Monday, and we will actually be speaking to him again next Monday, uh, has yet to really give an official date on when the state will 
lift that 14 day quarantine. Uh, and so we'll, we'll just have to continue to wait and see. We know that there are many people who are waiting to get back to uh, returning here to the islands. And of course the hospitality industry as well. Uh, but as of now, again, th that date has not yet been identified. We always like to talk about a Hawaii hero. Today, we're highlighting the Ulupono Initiative. They focus, of course, on the needs of people here in Hawaii. Um, and through a grant from the Hawaii Community Foundation, they've provided a Kapiolani Community College support to feed the college's summer, to support rather the college summer feeding program. Uh, KCC was able to help feed hungry children at various Oahu sites, all part of the Department of Ag's summer food service program. So wonderful to see that the need for food, of course, is very real. Um, and they're doing some things like this where they do the farm to car. Uh, wonderful to see that. If you want to learn more about what they're doing, check out their website, ulupono.com. We love the work that they've continued to do throughout our community for our community over the years and wonderful to see them stepping up uh, during this pandemic. That's right. And again, we want to thank all, all of our Hawaii heroes and all those who are doing good for our community. We've seen it time and time again companies, corporations, individuals stepping up to the plate to help. Uh, again, we want to highly encourage any of you, if you know of someone or some organization that is doing good in the community, please let us know in our notes. And we uh, really would like to highlight them as a hero because uh, as we've heard so many times uh, that it really is going to take uh, an effort by all of us involved in the community to help to uh, continue to support one another during a time where there's so many people that are struggling. So. Uh, again, we highlight today Ulupono, our Hawaii Hero of the Day. Uh, looking forward, we have uh, still a lot more exciting guests coming up, not only this week, but also next week. That's right. So tomorrow we're going to be talking, today was the health piece. Tomorrow we're talking more about the economic piece. There's a consortium of uh, organizations and business leaders coming together through Uplift Hawaii. So we're going to be talking to them about their ec economic recovery platform. And there's a way for you to get involved to try to help to steer the state, if you will, to figure out what our economic recovery is going to look like. Because obviously, we need a lot of help right now. And we need to figure out what direction we want to move towards. So we're excited to talk to those folks. Friday, Dave Matlin, we really want to know what is going to happen to athletics. And then next week, we have Governor David Ige, uh, Mayor Kirk Caldwell, Senator Schatz. So a lot of folks who are making a lot of big decisions, and we're looking forward to talking to each and every one of them. And that's right. Again, we thank all of you for tuning in. We have uh, those viewers who said they're watching from Illinois, from Chicago, from Texas in today. We love hearing uh, the reach that this program is having and certainly appreciate all of you tuning in every day here at 1030 and by sharing this conversation. Uh, again, we want to mahalo our sponsors of this program, the Hawaii Executive Collaborative and Hawaii Pacific Health for making this conversation possible. If you continue, we also encourage you to stay connected to the Honolulu Star Advertiser for the latest on COVID-19 and other Hawaii headlines throughout the day. Uh, until tomorrow at 10.30, we will say aloha and see you then. Aloha. <laughs>